You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Gelt Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Gelt will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. We are talking to Jim Richardson. Jim decided about 15 years ago it was time to change paths and speak out. And since that time, he's been giving keynotes, speeches, he's been in theater, stand-up, and probably more important is that he teaches techniques to people about how to speak and how to speak with great humor. His private clients include award-winning stand-up comedians, Emmy award-winning television personalities, actors, and leaders in all sorts of fields like religion, law, politics, and business. And business is why we're bringing you on. Jim, pleasure to have you. So great to hear from you. I'm out here in California, and I guess we're talking across the entire globe. This is great. <laughs> I need to have an excuse for why I would have a, a comedy coach on a personal finance show. So could you either tell me why or give me a good punchline I could use? Uh, well, I can do both. Um, how was copper wire invented? Oh, man, that's a tough one. Two lawyers were, fight two lawyers were fighting over a penny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's, there's the business and the lawyers. Lucky we don't have any lawyers who listen to the show. Done by. <laughs> um, basically, in business, you're talking about design, production, and sales. And the comedy comes in on the sales part of it. So if a politician were going to make jokes during their speech, or a keynote speaker were going to do so, or the boss was going to do it to his employees, they have a slightly different problem in the stand-up comic. Stand-up comic is to be entertaining. The other three categories of uh, occupation are trying to get a specific idea across. But both of them are selling their ideas, whether they're simply for entertainment or to get something done to get elected, to get a product mode, or to get an employee to do something. You're trying to get people to understand what you're talking about. And they're not even going to listen to you at what I've said so far. You're dead in the water. because. They have to, first of all, and every salesman knows it, they have to like you. Mm -hmm. Until they like you, until they can relate to you, they're not going to pay any attention to what they have to say. So be, I noticed this with my beginning comedy students. I still pe teach people at all levels, so I just see people walking right through the door. And the first thing they do is the problem that almost all business speakers and politicians do, and that is they talk at their audience instead of interacting with the audience, mm -hmm. which is odd because comedy is about interaction. Every 12 seconds or so, uh, in counting the audience response, the comic's going to be telling about four or five jokes a minute. That means the audience is going to be involuntarily interacting by laughing. Huh. Four to five times a minute. That's huge. It's huge. And when I was teaching, I remember uh, I accidentally, not even know it, thought the first stand-up comedy course for credit at, the, at any uh, university in the United States. I found that the people who were the funniest professors on campus would come down and kind of hang out in the hall and see what was going on in the class, see if they could pick up some pointers. And when they heard that the comics were getting four or five laughs a minute, they ran away. And I chased one of them down and said, what's the problem here? I thought you wanted to learn how to tell jokes better than you already do. You're already the funny guy on campus. He says, Jim, I tell one an hour. <laughs> I guess the college students have a very low uh, expectation of their professors. <laughs> well, professors aren't funny in general. They're talking at the students and not interacting with them. And it's odd because all you have to do is phrase something that demands a response. And you can, the simplest way to do it is to ask questions or tell jokes. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, then you're going to pull where people really know. And the professor tends to say things like, so this is true, yes or no, and then everyone kind of looks at him. What are you supposed to do, say no and get thrown out of class? <laughs> So but if you ask uh, questions that don't begin with the yes or no, then you're going to get people to really tell you what they think, and then you can build off of that. And you're pulling your audience when you're doing that. And the politicians, uh, if they integrate the polls, they do well. They're supposed to, but they tend not to. Sorry, you were going to say it? So when you're talking to people about, being, about humor, is it about telling jokes, or is, there, is it beyond that? Well, it depends. If there are serious people, business people, politicians, and so forth, um, 
I, I tell them that this is going to be the fastest way to sell your idea. Uh, the old thing is if you bring a bunch of people into a room and you want to get the meeting over with quickly, don't let them sit down, take the meeting standing up. It's sort of the same thing, except that you're trying to get your idea across not in as few paragraphs as possible, not in as few sentences as possible, but as few syllables as possible. And if you edit it down to that, get to the real kernel of what you're talking about, for instance, the lawyer joke I just told at the beginning, then the audience is going to understand what you're talking about right away because you've made it in something they can understand. And people can only think in terms of twos and threes. And I can prove this to you. If you go uh, to a store to get something and you have two or three items, you don't have to write it down. Right. right? Okay. If it's more than two or three items, every housewife knows you've got to write it down because you won't remember. Mm-hmm. And, and therefore, the people tend to hear in terms of two or three sentences at a time, which is exactly the formula for the joke. You have two or three set of lines and a punchline, and that's it. If you go further than that, you're nuts. <laughs> we are speaking to Jim Richardson, who teaches people how to be funny and, and how to use humor in many aspects of life. When you refer to yourself as a coach, what does it look like for someone to have a humor coach or a comedy coach? And again, let me just focus, someone who's not a comedian. Well, uh, George Kaufman, uh, Joseph Kaufman of the Kaufman and Hart uh, comedy writing team, playwrights at Broadway in the, in the 30s, Kaufman himself was known as a play doctor. So he would come in, uh, if anyone was a, a comedy or was a drama wasn't working, they'd have him come and suggest things that could fix it, and sometimes it was just not having enough lines for an actor or actress to make a cross, or it was overwritten, or whatever. I have sort of a similar function that I can see right away if they're wasting syllables, which is the primary problem, and sometimes they're wasting sentences. Very often they don't end on the right word. Um, the third term for writing jokes in addition to the setup and the punch is the punch word. Now let me just ask you a question, Doug. If I'm going to have a punch word, which the definition of thereby is that after I tell us where the audience is going to laugh, do I want the punch word at the beginning, the middle, or the end of the punch line? I presume at the end. Exactly, because otherwise they're going to keep talking and the people are going to start to laugh and then stop. I don't want to be rude. I don't want to interrupt them. I want to laugh as long and hard as possible. So if people phrased what they say to other people, that they, nobody would know what they were talking about until they said the last word of every three-word movement, people would hear it better because it would build up, boom. Hmm. And if you listen to your politicians or anybody on the, the radio or TV, you see this mistake being made over and over again. And people will often end with the preposition, which everybody knows is grammatically incorrect, but they'll also end with pronouns instead of using nouns and verbs for the last so uh, uh, two, lawyers, two lawyers flying over a copper wire, you end with a noun. It seems that some people are natural speakers and fabulous at the soundbite, whether it's uh, American presidents or even in Israel, our own prime minister. It just seems fabulous, the whole concept of soundbite. Are they trained for this, or do they somehow think in this way? Excellent question. I noticed you used twice the word seems. Okay. Because it is an illusion, it is an art, and it is a craft. Now, some people are better at it because their families tell a lot of jokes and they happen to be very good speakers. Uh, others can learn it. And, for instance, when John F. Kennedy was running for the presidency of the United States, when he was running uh, in the early part of the primary campaigns that precede who gets nominated over here, he was a terrible speaker. And then we see him get better and better and better, and suddenly everything's edited correctly, and he's ending on the punchlines and doing everything that he's supposed to be doing. And he was the first president that did not require the reporters to pre-submit questions that he would then prepare answers for. Okay. And what he did was he met with his writers, one of whom was Mort Saul, one of the greatest comedians uh, of the 1950s, who did the first comedy album that ever became a gold album and all that sort of thing. Um, with one of his writers, and they would just anticipate what the questions might be and write responses, and then he'd rehearse the response, and then when he did it, it would seem like it was spontaneous. <laughs> Do the presidents today, in fact, practice like that? If they're good, they do. Both Bushes were very good at that, and Barack Obama got a lot better, for instance, when he did his first uh, correspondence dinner where all the reporters come in February of each year, and he didn't do that well the second time. He was terrific. 
So he, he learned, he developed the skill. He tends to overwrite quite a bit, but he's getting better at it. And if he gets up against any part of Newt Gingrich, he'll have to be terrific because this guy's really had stuff tightly and gets responses even if you don't agree with him. So who knows what compromises are going to be made by the time they, they find out who's going to be the Republican nominee and who's going to be the vice president, who's going to get the promise for secretary of state, who's going to do what? We don't know at this point. If you look at the opponents of Mitt Romney, who's leading by a large margin and had up all their scores, it's a much tighter race if they all get together. Mm -hmm. And then oh. you're going to have to... Obama will have to step up to the plate and become a better writer. And this is interesting because uh, in the election where he won in, in 2008, he wasn't challenged. I see. He basically he was... just didn't do much, and the people were crazy and fell apart. Outside of the political realm, in terms of business, are there any role models that, let's say, a business manager could study if he wanted to become a more talented and persuasive salesman to his own staff and his own team? Yes, and Lee Iacocca was an excellent example of this. He would go for pathos and heroic endings. So you have the, uh, his speech would start off about how he was fired, and then by the end he would talk about how he was successful. And what he was doing basically was tapping into an archetype. That, uh, by archetype, I mean a character who is a hero that we believe, but don't admit we believe Knox is kind of a cynical era because of the economy and so forth, kind of like the 1920s here in the United States. But the archetype hero is someone that we believe in if we if it's put in the correct form for us in our particular era that our parents believed in, our grandparents going all the way back. And I found a very interesting thing. I was just watching the Internet uh, three or four years ago, and an old show that I know that I had liked called Have Gun, Will Travel. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was starring Richard Boone that ran from 1957 to 1963. Called, uh, his character was called Paladin, which goes back to the uh, Charlemagne uh, court, in which the Paladins were his, like his, it came before the um, Knights of the Round Table. It was the French version of it several hundred years before. And he basically represented this character on TV, his little half-hour television show, he dressed in black, but he was a hero who should be dressed in white. So he did, he did the kind of like little visual jokes, mm -hmm. and he would be hired to go to different parts of the country and solve problems where they needed a hired gun. Uh, but he would, he would act like he was the judge rather than just the villain. <laughs> and he would, he would uh, explain to people their position by referring to... Uh, someone who was highly educated, not only been trained at West Point, but he also had a good liberal arts education, so he could refer to the mythology from the Roman times. This reminds me of, and tell a little gag about that. So here's this highly educated guy. Remember, it's 57, 63, where uh, in the United States in, in the 20th century, higher education was being emphasized at more than any other time, uh, trying to get people to think about going to college. And here's this guy on television representing that, and he was the in the top ten for all six years that he was on television, and very often in his second or first. So this is now available on DVD, so people can see the all 240 episodes of become <laughs> Addicted, as I did. And in my newsletter, Cook says, Volume 1, Issue 2, I spent a lot of time talking about the archetype and showing how Barack Obama used that in his campaign and basically become the hero who can't be stopped. That's the leitmotif. No matter what happens, he can't be stopped. Amazing. And if the boss has this thing in his, uh, as, Iacocca, as Lee Iacocca did, and he would walk through the factory and talk to the various workers one-on-one, -on -one. and this is the key in the United States and in Israel and in every democracy, that everybody is equal. So when John McCain said that one famously during the debate and pointed at Barack Obama, he was saying that Obama was not equal to him. That finished him with the American public because the American public believes everybody's equal. Whether it's true or not, Another question, but that's the fundamental belief. That's the archetypal belief that the country is based on. And, and Richard Boone re would represent this, and Barack Obama uh, represented that. And if Mitt Romney keeps forgetting it, which he seems to be doing, talking about his wife having two Cadillacs and all the money he made in business, that's not equal. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to have to follow that one up again soon. We've been talking to Jim Richardson, who teaches comedy. He's got a huge amount of experience. Jim, in the last couple of seconds, could you just tell people, how can they learn more about the work that you do? 
Well, you find jimrichardson.com. It's Jim like James Richardson, like son of Richard. Jimrichardson.com. You'll find about six hours of stuff that's free on the internet if you like that. Then you can take my courses long distance. I do video conferencing so I can easily reach Israel or anywhere else in the world and give you all these techniques. We're just talking in general about this now. And it's very important that you understand fundamentally a concept that George Burns, the famous comedian, said, and that is in show business, honesty is the most important thing. You've got to be honest. In fact, once you can fake that, you got it made. <laughs> All right. Jim Richardson, thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.